and overcome growth bottlenecks and add to the economy in full potential. Question hour over. Bills for introduction. Further discussion on the motion moved by Mrs. Kavita Patidar on 2nd February 2024 and the amendments thereto. Sri Swendu Sekhar Ray. Thank you, sir. At the outset, I would like to respectfully submit that in the address to the both houses of parliament by the Honorable President of India, okay. I have found after Ek Bharat, Sister Bharat, and Atmanirbhar Bharat some new coins like Bikshit Bharat used at least six times and Amrit expressed for about ten times such as Ajadi Ka Amrit Kaal, Amrit Kaal of our independence, Amrit Kalash, Amrit Sarovars, Amrit Mahatsab twice, Amrit Batikas, Amrit Bharat Station, Amrit Bharat Train, Amrit Generation. So, Charo or Sri Amriti Amrit hai. Jolo, ye Amrit Pira hai, unka baat chhod dijiye. Jolo, halahal Pira hai. जो लोग हलाहल यानी कि जहर पी रहे हैं उनके लिए ये बहुत सोच की बात है कि ये अमृत लोक में बात कर रहे हैं ये अमृत लोक में जीवित है या दूसरा कोई परलोक में तो नहीं चले गए अमृत लोक सुनते सुनते उनका परलोक का याद आ रहा है सर इट इज ए Make believe situation. How it has been coined like Amrit Kaal everywhere, every sphere of light of the society, I do not understand. Anyway, the prerogative of the government. At page three of the pointed booklet, it is said, quote, last year my government has given government jobs to lakhs of youth in mission mode, unquote. So it is not in the distant past we heard about that two crores of jobs will be given to jobless per year. And by this time, the number ought to have been 20 crores because this government has already spent 10 years in power. Uh, now the question is, when it is said that lacks of jobs, the natural question comes as how many lacks? There is no mention about this. How many jobless were there? And out of how many jobless were given, how many lacks of jobless were given jobs? And how many remaining? These are the pertinent questions which have not been addressed by the Honorable President, which has a speech which has been prepared by this government. So should, I, should, we, should we take it as another jumla? Yes. Sir, it is said in page four of this speech that government enacted important legislations with the cooperation of the all parliamentarians, including that draconian law, Nyay Sanghita which according to me is a nice Sangeeta. Anyway, but this claim that all parliamentarians supported the bills when it was introduced and discussed, this is not true. This is incorrect information. 
Why, and as a keen reader of history, it reminds me to a situation in the year 1933 when Hitler in Germany, he brought one enabling act which will enable his cabinet to legislate instead of the parliament and for which no presidential assent will be required. And what happened? The law was passed. It is called enabling law. It was passed in Hitler's regime in Germany in 1933 after sending 106 parliamentarians to concentration camp. Thereafter, the bill was passed. Here we have seen that after suspension of 146 parliamentarians, these bills were passed. And the number 146, suspension of 146 parliamentarians in Indian parliament is the highest ever in the history of parliamentary democracy around the world so far. Therefore, the statement made in the Honorable President's speech, I should not say that it is far from truth, but it is incorrect and purposefully given by the government to create a confusion in the minds of the people. Sir, in page 6, paragraph 9 of the speech, Niti Ayog claimed that about 25 crore countrymen have been lifted out of poverty in the last one decade. That is during this Amrit Kal. My question is that out of how many poverty ridden people 25 crore have been lifted out of poverty as claimed by Niti Ayo. What was the exact number of poverty ridden people when they came to power in 2014? And out of which, when they say they 25 crore have been lifted out, how many remaining? These questions have not been addressed. Therefore, all these are half-truths. I'm sorry to say. In this way, a series of lofty claims have been made in this report card of the government to carry out disinformation campaign on the eve of the Lok Sabha election. Reality is altogether different, sir. Madam, I would like to refer to Article 39 of the Constitution, Clause B. It says categorically, it is under the directive principles of state policy. The state shall, in particular, direct its policy towards securing that the ownership and control of the material resources of the community are so distributed as best to subserve the common good. And Clause C says, you are aware, Madam, very much. Clause C says that the operation of the economic system does not result in the concentration of wealth and means of production to the common detriment, unquote. Now, what is happening? What is the scenario of Indian economy? Inequality has gone to what extent? I may, I may kindly be permitted to refer a few points from the Oxfam report 2023, which was released in January this year, 15 January this year. The government does not accept that report, but we, we put very much reliance on this report because of the practical situation in in the country. Number one, the richest 1% in India owns more than 40% of the country's total wealth. Number two, the bottom half of the population shares just 3% of the national wealth. 
Number three, Indian government recently cut taxes on corporation while introducing a centralized tax system that is GST that led to increased indirect taxation of households. A one-time 2% 2 tax on billionaires' entire wealth put support to rupees 40,423 crore for mal malnourished individuals for the next two years, and you are giving concessions to the corporations, corporates. Next, female workers earned only 63 paisa for every one rupee a male worker earned. Scheduled caste and rural workers earn significantly less than advantaged, advantaged social groups. This is part, very much pertinent, Madam, this point. Billionaires in India witnessed a 121% surge in wealth since the pandemic began. Until November 2022, this is going on, the surge of their wealth. And at, during the pandemic, it was 121% surge. One particular Indian billionaire whose portfolio includes energy companies has seen his wealth soared by 46% in 2022. 64% of the total GST came from the bottom 50% of the population in 21-22. <coughs> total number of billionaires in India increased from 102 in 2020 to 166 in 2022. India's 100 richest combined wealth reached 660 billion US dollar, that is, in Indian currency, 54.12 lakh crore. This is the <coughs> economic inequality which must be resisted as per the dictum of the Constitution as enshrined in Article 39 B and C. In India, 72 TV channels, 72 TV channels reaching over 800 million people are owned by one particular billionaire. In India, a one of tax on unrealized gains from 2017 till 2021, from just one billionaire, would have raised 21.95 billion US dollars, enough to employ more than 5 million Indian primary school teachers for a year. Such a huge economic inequality, and we are chanting the mantra of Amrit Kaal, Amrit Mahatsav, and Amrit, Amrit, Amrit. Sir, madam, forget about Oxfam report, because government does not believe in that report. But UNDP report in regard to Asia-Pacific Human Development Report of 2024, released on 15th of January this year, what does it say? Only three, four bullet points. In India, income distribution has become more squid with the top 10% of the population getting 57% of national income, even if we report. The top 1% get 22% of the national income, indicating one of the most unequal income distribution. Top 10% of the population control 65% of the nation's total wealth, highlighting significant wealth inequality. Growing evidence of a strong rise in wealth inequality, particularly in the post-COVID period. Finally, from UNDP report, women constitute only 23% of the labor force, and certain groups like informal workers and interstate migrants are at greater risk of falling back into poverty. My submission is that unless this huge inequality is removed on war footing, one cannot rule out the possibility of social unrest or upheaval. Now, the rural wage rates and inequality. Agricultural labor real wage rate increased by 4.6%. The real wage rates of non-agricultural and construction workers are lower at the end of the period. That is 20, 
14 till 2022. Non-agricultural workers from the majority, and they are 68.9% they are in all agricultural laborers, are they among the employed in rural in India. For approximately 35% of India's workforce, real wages have not grown since 2014. For long 10 years in Omrit Kal, for 10 years of Omrit Kal, no rise in the real wages of 35% of India's workforce. Even in sectors with an increase in real wage rates, the growth rate is overshadowed by the overall per capita income growth. So this mismatch must be looked at, into by the government. There is no murmur, no whisper about how this problem will be solved by the government in the Honorable President's speech. Now, <clears throat> after even the Labor Bureau report. What is Labor Bureau report? <coughs> Labor Bureau report, it says, Labor Bureau report, three and four, seven. Sorry, I have already mentioned about this workforce, so I'm not going to repeat the Labor Bureau report. Now the question of federalism. The question of federalism. When this government came to power, everybody listened again and again repeatedly that this government believed in cooperative federalism. Cooperative federalism. Now it is not, now it is not being mentioned. mentioned because it has already become non-cooperative federalism. <laughs> the glaring example of federalism is that a free state which is ruled by opposition parties, their leaders are being hounded by the central agencies. Never in the history of India this happened. Double engine government we require. Therefore, these govern, uh, the government, opposition rule governments are to be dislodged by hook or crook. And this is going on every day. Even a Dalit, Dalit chief minister has not been spared. The one nation, one election call comes from where? Is it in our constitution? No. Has it been recorded, recommended by the election commission? No. And surprisingly, the retired president of India has been appointed to head a committee. And that committee is now started discussing on what footing that is, it is to be implemented as soon as possible. Our Chief Minister, Ms. Mamta Banerjee, has already written to the committee. And she's also coming to attend the meeting tomorrow. That nothing will be accepted, accepted by our state, at least, on this issue. I sincerely believe the other opposition states, they will also not accept because this is going to be a serious, there will be serious ramifications, serious consequences. Draconian. It is draconian. Our constitutional scheme is altogether different. We are a parliamentary democracy, not a presidential form of government like USA. But this will open the door for presidential form of government, I apprehend. That is why I totally oppose to this idea of one nation, one election. <clears throat> there is a consistent tendency to erode the fiscal and economic policy space of space government. Resources transferred to states have been subject to regressive conditions and a significant portion is kept out of the Finance Commission's ambit, allowing central control over their issue. Why this government is not following the Recommendations of Sarkarya Commission. 
And what about the second commission, UNCHI Commission on Central State Relations? In 2010, Justice Punchi Commission submitted its recommendation to the Dizan government, and we are in 24, 14 years elapsed. No murmur about that recommendation. 14 years are not enough to finalize the recommendations of the Central State Relations recommended by the Punchi Commission. Why the government is avoiding? Because the constitutional heads of the states, their heads will be rolled down if the commission's recommendations are given effect to. Because the Punchi Commission has categorically stated, while appointing governors, the state governments must be consulted and their concurrence is must. They must not act. They must not act as agents of the central government as it is happening now. Madam, rampant misuse of central agencies I have already mentioned. Now my driving points to my state about how this federalism is being respected. Only one or two points. Four minutes. Center has resorted to fiscal terrorism in Bengal. Yes, fiscal terrorism going on in our state by the center. How many central teams were sent to Bengal? More than 100. 156 teams were sent to Bengal to look into the implementation of the centrally sponsored schemes. And wherever the deficiencies or defects were found, each and every deficiency and defects were removed, intimated, even though in the entire country, West Bengal had been singled out and all dues to the extent of 1,16,000 crores, central government has stopped. It, has, it is an economic blockade. They want to kill the poor people. Terrorism. It is fiscal terrorism. That is why because they thought that by suspending uh, the release of the fund, it will have good effect for them in the ensuing election. No. People have understood what is what. Now, therefore, our Honorable Chief Minister on the other day, 3rd February, she announced the state government from its own fund will give the dues of the workers 21 lakh workers who could not get the wages, they will be paid out of state funds. We are not depending upon the central funds, but we'll definitely take out the issue to the uh, people, and the people of Bengal will give a befitting reply for such fiscal anarchy. Yes. There are other points also, Manrega, but my time is limited. Almost only two minutes. Yes. So to conclude, to conclude, I would like to respond in reference to paragraph 37 of the president's speech. I don't like to mention because paucity of time what he said there, but everybody knows that is the concluding paragraph. I would like to quote from Rabindranath Tagore a few lines from his Bengali poem written. 123 years back, the name of the poem is Deen Dan. Deen means poor, Dan means gift. Quote, few lines. There is no God in that temple, said the saint. The king was enraged. No God? Oh, saint, aren't you speaking like an atheist? On that throne studded with priceless gems, beams a golden idol, and yet you proclaim that it is empty? It is not empty. Rather, it is full of royal pride. You have bestowed yourself, O king, not the god of this world, remarked the saint. And it continued. In the very year 
in which 20 million of your subjects were struck by a terrible drought, the desperate masses without any food or shelter, came begging at your door crying for help, only to be turned away. They were forced to take refuge in forest caves, camping under roadside foliages, derelict old temples, and in that very year, when you spent two million gold coins to build that grand temple of yours. That is the day God left that temple of yours and joined the poor. Your mundane temple is hollow. It is just a bubble of wealth and pride. The enraged king howled. Oh, you sham cretin of a person, leave my kingdom this instant. The saint replied very calmly to the very place to which you have exiled the divine. Banish now the devout too. Thank you. Thank you, madam.